Okay, so it's a real pleasure. It's actually an honor to be able to introduce our 12th QMADE seminar presenter, Dr. Lauren McLennigan. Uh, Lauren has, actually, she has quite a title. She is, let me see if I can get this right. She is Associate Professor of Environmental Studies and History and Canada Research Chair on in Ocean History and Sustainability. And all of that is at the University of Victoria in Canada, right? Uh, she gained her PhD from Scripps Institution of Oceanography. She got an MA from the University of Oregon. Uh, you're hanging out in the Pacific a lot, Lauren. Uh, she got a BA from Middlebury College, which I don't think is on the Pacific, right? Um, Lauren is really well known for her marine historical ecology work, which is, and she's a leader in, I would say, marine historical ecology. And it's focused heavily on the use of historical documents and maps and other sources of historical information. But she's also a respected marine conservation biologist. She is a 2019 Pew Fellow in marine conservation. And her current work really focuses on integrating historical data into fisheries management. So today, Lauren will give a talk titled Using Archives to Understand Ecological Dynamics in Coastal Oceans. Um, and I um, just wanted to mention that those are watching on the on the channel uh, after, on the recording that some of this these parts of the this talk will be embargoed so you'll you might see it skipping that's why it skips so Lauren it's truly an honor to have you here thank you so much for giving us your time to give us this seminar I'll hand it over to you now great thanks very much I'm just going to go ahead and share All right. Um, well, thanks. Thanks very much for the intro and for the invitation to participate in this really excellent series. Um, I was uh, thinking about what I could contribute um, to this, this really great lineup of, of talks, and I thought that I would focus specifically on um, using historical archives, um, so historical written records, to understand um, ecological dynamics in coastal ecosystems. So I'll be focusing on the idea of, of using uh, records and approaches that are typically undertaken by historians and applying those to understanding um, ocean ecosystems and conservation. I'm actually gonna start on land though, um, with this classic ecosystem dynamic, which is the population cycles of predator-prey interactions, which are shown here. It's one of the most fundamental concepts in modern ecology. A graph like this probably appears in every undergraduate ecology textbook. Um, and it was based on observations of population cycles of two species, the, um, the snowshoe hare and the Canadian lynx over about a century. So if you look at this graph, it goes back to 1850. Um, so how do we know about numbers of, of uh, lynx and rabbit in uh, the middle of the 19th century? Um, it's because of their pelts. It's because um, they their fur was uh, part of this really high value trade in North America. And um, we see some images of those pelts being um, prepared here for trade in, in Canada in the 1890s. Um, and so the uh, the the pelts um, were part of this really high value trade and the records of those trade were kept by Hudson Bay Company and others and can be found in archives like this. So this is an example of um, trade records from the beginning of the 19th century and an example of the archives that house these, these trade records. Um, so we have this information about these about these animals because of this <clears throat> trade and because this trade was so valuable, we kept the um, the archives of um, of that trade in, in places like this. They were first um, accessed and published by ecologists in the 1920s. So this book, The Conservation of the Wildlife of Canada, was published in 1921, and it's the first uh, publication of these uh, data. They were then further explored by ecologists in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Um, so um, now we have this information going back to the 1740s, um, documenting these cyclical patterns in the numbers of, um, of these animals that were, um, that were traded. And importantly, this was accepted as a proxy of abundance by ecologists over this long time period. So again, these are, these are trade records um, of, doc of the documented uh, fur trade. 
um, that have been uh, accepted and used in, in ecology um, since the 1920s. And so these historical archival data have been central to understanding these fundamental concepts in ecology um, since um, about a century. Um, so what does this have to do with the ocean? Uh, similar uh, archival material and trade existed for, uh, for ocean species like the Atlantic cod shown here in the similar time period in the 1890s. These are dried cod that are baled and um, are ready for sale in uh, Frenchman's Bay in Maine. And so um, similar records exist for the ocean, but the realization that these historical data have value to marine ecology has been much more recent. Um, it's only been um, the last couple of decades, I think, that we've realized that these, these archives have value in the same way that they've been used um, uh, on land. And so I would uh, personally point to um, this paper, which I'm sure everybody in the room has, um, has, has read, but for I think it's um, the point at which it became uh, important to start thinking about archives um, as a source of material to understand ecological change, the um, 2001 paper, Historical Overfishing and the Recent Collapse of Coastal Ecosystems, pointed to some of the, the ways that ecologists were really getting the story wrong by not thinking about the, um, the long-term impacts and the ways that we need to start thinking about using a variety of different types of data, including archival data, to get at those um, long-term drivers uh, of change. So the archives, um, I would argue, became a new frontier of marine science. So um, going from exploring underwater to understand how, uh, how ecosystems uh, have changed the dynamics underpinning their, their function to heading into um, libraries and archives to look through documents to understand uh, those dynamics in a, in a different um, spatial and, uh, and temporal context. And so we know now that there are diverse historical sources um, that can give insight into these coastal dynamics. So I mentioned uh, exploitation and trade documents like this picture here for Atlantic Cod. Um, these typically span a couple of centuries. We have other types of written records like narrative descriptions, maps, and nautical charts that can sometimes go back farther in time. More recently, we have things like newspaper articles and photographs, and collectively, these can tell stories and help to understand dynamics in various different uh, ways in different places. I think it's also important um, to frame this conversation about archival documents by talking about a little bit about the ways that these reflect human values at different points in time. So we. Um, have really rich records um, for particular species in particular places, um, but it really is tied to the value that those species had um, to people uh, in, in different contexts. So for example, we have um, information that comes from restaurant menus like these from Hawaii in the 1920s, um, and they are representing the consumptive value that, um, that people had for these species that show up on those menus um, over time. Um, another example are uh, these, these uh, photographs from the um, recreational, recreational fishery in Florida, and this is representing the fact that these large fish were valued as a sport, as a, as a way of interacting with the environment in, uh, in, for leisure, and so they show up in the archive for that reason. Um, and then uh, another type of value that shows up um, in the archives is represented here by these nautical charts in the, from the 1770s. And um, these are representing the value that um, the British Empire placed on really understanding the intricacies of coastal um, environments so that they would be able to be nimble with their ships and to navigate them without, um, without shipwreck. And so we have, um, sometimes uh, surprising uh, rich records for particular species in particular places, but it's not consistent. And so we have to be um, sort of creative in thinking about the ways that we can find these sources in archives by thinking about the ways that people valued um, these uh, different species in different places and time. Okay, so using archives to understand the dynamics of coastal ecosystems relies both on finding that information in archives and then also um, understanding how we can apply it to different uh, types of coastal dynamics. So what do we want to know? We want, might want to know something about um, species abundance and distribution, and this is something that can come out of archival records. We might want to know something about interactions of key species um, over space and time. 
We may want to know something about drivers of change um, and how those impacted various components of ecosystems over time. And then we might want to know something about um, impacts on coastal communities, so sort of the social component of this uh, dynamic as well. And so there's, of course, lots of other things that we, that we might be interested in knowing, but these are just some examples of the way that I'm thinking about um, defining this idea of dynamics of coastal ecosystems. Um, so in um, my talk today, I am going to give three examples of using archives. Um, so um, nautical charts, newspaper articles, um, and uh, commercial surveys are the three types of archival records that I'll be talking about and thinking about using them to understand the dynamics of coastal ecosystems, um, thinking about change in distribution and abundance, temperature-driven changes, and changing species interactions. Um, so the first uh, source that I, uh, and I'm framing this all around the sources to, to think about the ways that these sources can tell us about, uh, about uh, ecological change. And so the first source that I wanted to highlight is this um, 18th century nautical chart, um, which is from the Florida Keys and provides uh, really nice information on uh, coral reef ecosystems. And so this is an extract from this nautical chart and we can see that these red blocks uh, are blown up and, and you can see that there's coral, coral uh, banks and uh, coral rocks that are highlighted here. Um, and um, these are, this is a really rich source of information on, on coral reefs in, this is uh, Key West uh, being shown here. And as I mentioned, the reason for this isn't necessarily because uh, of a, a strong interest in coral reef ecology or natural history, but because um, of the history of shipwrecks in this region. So the Spanish uh, vessel, the Atocha went down in the Florida Keys and when the British empire took possession of the Keys for about two decades at the end of the 18th century, they really dedicated a lot of effort to mapping them to avoid uh, a similar outcome. And so the Florida Keys were mapped over about a three year period in the 1770s. Um, so uh, George Gould was the surveyor who led this uh, charge. He and his team mapped the lower Florida Keys in 1774, mapped the upper Florida Keys in 1775. So we can see these two maps here. Um, my understanding is that there was an intention to continue mapping, um, but uh, in 1776, the American Revolution happened and George Gould was, uh, sent back to the UK um, via um, uh, via Jamaica as a as a as a prisoner of war, and so uh, this uh, mapping um, uh, uh, effort stopped. But we he left behind these really great high resolution uh, maps, which I obtained from the UK Admiralty Library. And so the question, um, the ecological question that we're able to ask with this is the persistence, about the persistence of coral reefs over time. So the question of how many historical coral observations from the 1770s are in locations that contain coral today. Um, and so this is a modern um, view of the same spot, Key West in 2016. And so we just compared those locations of coral um, being mapped in the 1770s to those that exist 240 some years later. The other thing um, that's really uh, nice about this particular historical data source is that it turns out that George Gould was in fact a really amazing natural historian. He didn't necessarily have to be, um, but he seemed to have a really strong interest in um, describing aspects of, of the environment um, that went beyond sort of the basic navigational uh, mapping that he was charged with. So for example, um, he delineated reef zones, which I've outlined here in black, that really nicely map onto our understanding of modern ecology in this, in this area. So he separated the Florida Bay, this um, sort of area with less uh, water movement in uh, sort of a more enclosed space, the nearshore patch reef, the offshore patch reef, the reef crest, and the four reef. And because he was um, so careful at outlining this, it allowed us to um, do a really fine scale analysis uh, fine scale analysis of the spatial component of change. And so these, this rainbow uh, pattern here maps onto his five different reef zones um, from the Florida Bay out to the four reef. And um, we found at, with looking at looking at this um, in this spatially delineated way was uh, really striking. So we found that there was an almost 90% decline in coral in the Florida Bay 
There was a large decline as well in the nearshore patch reef, so about 70% decline. Um, and these are the, the reefs that you might uh, snorkel to from, from the islands of the Keys. For example, um, this inset here um, is from Bahia Honda, and we can see the, um, the little X's are on coral that no longer exist. And so this yellow um, nearshore patch reef is completely eliminated in this spot. There's also um, qualitative data that accompany the charts that describe this extensive inshore coral. So he writes that Bahia Honda, this area here, had a good deal of coral, which made it ideal for anchoring, and that the Key West Channel, um, which is what I just showed you in those earlier charts, um, had two or three patches of coral rocks with two and a half and three fathoms of water nearly in mid-channel. So um, these, these, much of this, this patch reef is, is not there anymore. Um, in contrast, the, um, the reef crest shown in blue and the four reef shown in purple are really largely intact as reef habitat. There have been um, extensive losses of live coral over the past three decades or so that have been measured um, in other ways, but this is uh, indicating that those, those reef, the reef structure is still there in those, in those places in ways that it isn't in the Florida Bay and inshore reefs. And so the archival data in this case provides um, a spatial component that was previously missing from analyses of the timing of early coral loss. So there's been really good paleo um, work in this area from coral cores like this one shown here that um, suggest abrupt changes in the salinity and eutrophication of the Florida Bay. And this has been linked in in time to um, some large scale land use and hydrological changes. So in particular, the linking of the islands of the Florida Keys by a causeway at the beginning of the 20th century and then later by a railroad, um, and uh, the decrease in freshwater runoff um, in that same time period that was associated with changes in the Everglades and the, um, the, 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 the huge um, changes that, that happened there um, have been uh, uh, they, these, these signals show up um, in, in, uh, in time in these coral cores, but a major limitation of this has been an understanding of the spatial extent um, of this change. And so the archives really dovetail with this paleo work to provide this landscape view of change and to show that the changes that happened in the Florida Bay were in fact um, quite extensive spatially. Um, so uh, this example of using archives to understand um, the uh, dynamics of coastal ecosystems. In this case, the nautical charts um, show this change in distribution and abundance over this 240 year time period, which is um, likely linked to this early habitat modification that we know about from other, other sources. Okay, I wanna um, move now um, up the coast from the Florida Keys to the Atlantic um, coast and the coast of Maine and talk about um, a different type of source um, from a different period of time. So uh, these are uh, trade newspapers published by and for the fishing community. So the Maine Coast fishermen, the Atlantic fishermen and the national fishermen. Um, and these are newspapers that really represent the, um, the daily observations of the fishing community. So they, they are writing about um, things that are of concern um, to, to, to different communities up and down the coast, um, in this case of the, um, of the US Atlantic seaboard. Um, and these types of observations are particularly relevant um, during periods of rapid temperature change. So we know that there has been modern warming that's affected fisheries um, since the late 1990s. This is showing the temperature anomaly in the Gulf of Maine. Um, and so we can see that uh, from 1998, there's, it's been anomalously warm, but it's not the only period of, of um, rapid temperature change. There was a period of historical warming that affected the um, Atlantic coast in the uh, 1940s and early 1950s. And it was followed by a period of um, rapid cooling. And so we know that um, warming, this warming period that we've seen over the last couple of decades has had and is having impacts on modern fisheries. So for example, in Maine, the lobster fishery is one that's um, impacted by, by warming waters. These two um, news articles describing that in the New York Times and Washington Post. But the question of how this compares to past periods of warming is one that the archives can help us understand. And so these are just some examples of the warm water impacts that showed up in Maine in this early period of warning in the, warming in the 1940s and 1950s. 
So this article here in uh, 1953 describing uh, soft shell lobsters or shedders that were caught as early as the middle of May, the earliest any of these fishermen can remember the warm winters are blamed for the early catch of shedders. And so this phenological change um, that happened due to warming waters in the 1950s was paralleled by one that happened in 2012 in this uh, in a relatively warm period, which resulted in um, a glut of, of lobsters on the market, which had an impact on the industry. So this uh, showing up also in the 1950s is, is interesting. Um, in 1947, um, this article describing the clam fisheries, so the thawing of the clam flats from the mild weather brought on many clam diggers. The increased production of clams was so great that the market was glutted. And then the third example that I highlight here is from 1950, talking about the experimental holding of European oysters, which survived a relatively warm winter in 1949 and 1950. So these are just examples of the types of um, ways that fishermen and fishing communities are describing the impacts of warming waters on different fisheries. And so we collected up um, hundreds of these articles um, and coded them for a couple of different um, types of things. So the first was the type of impact, um, increase, scarcity, access, or condition. Those were the four main types of impacts. And then perception of those impacts. So whether the fishing community was viewing those as generally positive, generally negative, or neutral in terms of their impact. And then we compared those across these three periods of rapid temperature change. So the historical warming period, the historical cooling, and the modern warming. Um, so I'll show you a series of these uh, pretty simple figures here that show the type of impact on the top and the perception on the bottom. Um, and so this is showing, this is highlighting the historical warming um, articles. These were generally um, linked to um, increase and generally viewed as positive. So this quote here from 1947 is an example of one of these. The temperature of the water has been just a little above average this summer, and all indications are that this has been an excellent season for spawning of our shellfish. A warm fall will mean their continued growth, giving them a better chance of survival. So an example of a, um, uh, a fishery that was perceived to be positively impacted by warming waters. In contrast, um, the modern warming was linked to scarcity and uh, more, most frequently viewed negatively, so strongly negative views of, of the impact of warming water. So an example of this is from 2013, the Gulf of Maine shrimp went into stock collapse that triggered the first total shutdown of the winter fishery since 1978. Hopes for a return may be dashed by warming average water temperatures in the Gulf, pushing shrimp farther north and east. So we have these um, similar uh, warming um, events that happened in uh, the 1940s and, and recently, but they're viewed really differently. Um, and so what's changed over this over this uh, 70 or so year time period? I think one of the things that's changed is that there's um, a reduced diversity in the fisheries that are targeted. Um, and we see this in the in our in our data um, that there were more than two times the number of historical fisheries described as affected by warming waters. Um, and this is, I think, reflecting the, um, the lack of diversification of these fisheries that's, that's happened um, over time. Reduced diversity is a key predictor of a loss of resilience in marine fisheries. And so I think there's this um, uh, observation of warming happening against this, uh, this set of fisheries that have been uh, reduced in, um, in diversity. Another indicator of this is the um, uh, overall landings that have, have declined over this, this time period. So if we look at the um, overall, the landings in this, the fisheries landings in this part of the world um, over time, the landings peaked in 1985, declining by about 40% um, over this, this time period. And the majority of the top fisheries peaked before 1980, which is what I'm showing you here. These are some of the um, fisheries that show up in our, um, in our newspaper articles. And we can see that the peak year for many of these was in the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s. So this historical warming that was happening um, was uh, happening in the 1940s, sort of before the um, the the big expansion in these in these fisheries and the subsequent decline, and so it was happening against this period of optimism and expansion, and so it was viewed more often as as something that could add rather than detract from the fisheries. 
And in contrast, this modern warming is happening against this backdrop of, of really degraded fisheries and in uh, some cases just really restricted fisheries in terms of access. And so the fishing community is, is seeing the, the warming as, as more negative in part, I think, because of this overall um, degradation that's happened in these systems. Um, so historical cooling, um, I wanted to highlight as well because it surprised me a little bit um, in that the historical cooling, cooling period was viewed as negatively as the modern warming, and it was typically linked to um, scarcity and access. So this um, quote here showing an example of what, what that looks like. So sheltered harbors, coves, and inlets frozen over with ice nearly a foot thick that left small longliners and other inshore craft jammed in the ice and this inshore fishing fleet uh, pract practically at a standstill. So it was frequently linked to, to freezing, to ice, and to an inability to access the fisheries that um, people were, were hoping to. And so I think this um, is relevant um, to, to modern uh, climate adaptation and conservation in a slightly different way, which is that um, historical cooling periods uh, really help to inform the local understanding of the climate history. These memories of, of cold are often really extreme associated with freezing in places that people know well, um, and they're often visual. Some of these um, pictures here accompany those newspaper articles. Um, and these, these images and these stories of freezing events in places that people uh, know really well have long cultural longevity. And so they're often um, referenced, I think, and used as evidence that the modern temperature events are cyclical, um, which has implications for, for adaptation in these fisheries. Okay, so this second example of uh, newspaper articles as a type of archival data source can uh, shed light on the ways that these uh, different perceptions of these similar temperature driven impacts show up in, um, in these fisheries over time, which I think are likely linked to environmental and social changes that have happened in these places. Okay, the final um, uh, story that I want to tell is moving from the East Coast to the Pacific and asking the question, um, can history help understand key ecological relationships? And so I'll be talking here about um, the Southern Sea Otter in California and the kelp forests that they inhabit. So the history of otter decline is really well known, and we know about that um, from many of the same types of sources that I started off talking about, these trade records associated with the fur trade. Um, here are some images that accompany those of, of sea otters. Um, their pelts were, were very, very valuable um, and traded in, um, in global markets, many of them heading to, um, to high value markets in Asia. We see these piles of the sea otter pelts, which really represent um, a, a massive and, um, and very focused uh, attempt to, 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 um, to uh, harvest these species for that market. Um, the, the fur trade in California existed from the end of the 1700s to the middle of the 1800s, um, but it was really the first two decades of the 19th century that had the biggest impact. So um, this is showing the total number of sea otters that were caught in California during the fur trade over this time. Um, and it was so extensive and impactful that they were thought, the sea otters were thought to be entirely extinct in the state of California. About um, 70 years or so after the end of the fur trade, there was a discovery of a remnant colony. Um, so in 1915, the lighthouse keeper, John Astrom, reported to the California Department of Fish and Game that he had observed a small otter population off the coast of Big Sur. So this really remote and rocky uh, portion of the coast um, that was uh, largely unobserved. Uh, it was, this was, uh, this colony was, was confirmed and uh, about two decades later it was reported by Life magazine to the public that the extinct sea otter swims back to life. So the um, otter population in California was discovered in 1915, but it had already been protected in 1911 under the Fur Seal Treaty. So this was the first international treaty to address wildlife preservation. And as the name implies, it was primarily focused on fur seals, but it was uh, protecting of all fur-bearing mammals, including otters. So the otters that were discovered in, in 1915 had already um, had protection in this um, international treaty. They later gained protection by the state of California and the US 
federal government under the Endangered Species Act and the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And populations um, of southern sea otters have increased since protection in 1911. This first graph is showing the population increase from 1911 to about 1990. You can see that it's um, responding uh, positively to, to protection, and then the population continues to grow to something around 3,000 um, individuals uh, today. So as the population grew in numbers, it also expanded um, up and down the coast. So we can see here that 1938 population in Monterey County in Big Sur, and then expanding to inhabit the coast from just south of San Francisco to Point Conception in Santa Barbara. So uh, the range has expanded, but it still is concentrated along a relatively small stretch of coast in Central California. We can see here the, the range um, from um, San Francisco down to Santa Barbara uh, in, in comparison to its historical range all up and down the California coast. So we care about otters um, for a number of reasons. One of those is that they are keystone species in kelp forests. And so we know this um, from observations of recovering otters uh, first in Alaska, so that uh, as otters um, recover, they consume uh, sea urchins, which graze on kelp. And so in the presence of sea otters, kelp forests are more abundant. They're, they're, they host uh, more fin fish, which bring in a variety of other predators. And so we know that otters are important in kelp forests, but um, we don't necessarily uh, have a sense of how recovery at these um, spatial scales and the, over this longer temporal scale over the century long scale of protection in California uh, affected kelp forests in these, um, in these places. So we know a lot about, uh, about otters because of the various values that they had. They were exploited and valuable in trade. We um, care about them, as I just mentioned, for their role in ecosystems. They're also charismatic megafauna. So there's lots of reasons that we have documentation of otters over time. Kelp are different. We don't have the same um, set of values, or we haven't had the same set of values associated with kelp. And so looking for historical documents for kelp is um, a little bit more uh, difficult. So what sorts of historical sources do we have? We have um, some examples of nautical charts from the 19th century. So this is one from Point Loma in Southern California. We can see it says thick kelp. And in this one, this uh, particular map from uh, 1894, it says there was a passage through the kelp in that year. And so kelp like coral could be navigational hazards. And so sometimes they show up in these nautical charts. We also have earlier descriptions from natural historians. Um, so explorers sometimes recorded kelp alongside other more charismatic species like the um, extinct stellar, stellar sea cow, which is shown here um, eating kelp. And this uh, this description of kelp showing that it covered, um, that this, this particular area was covered with beds of the seaweed and it describes the ways that the kelp functions to, um, to to be buoyed up by their air bladders and that this made for a really beautiful appearance. So we do have some descriptions here and there of kelp along the um, coast um, of North America, but this in itself is really not enough to be able to um, make any sort of uh, assessments over, um, over big spatial and temporal scales. This um, changed in the early 20th century when kelp became valued as a product for war in World War I. So the term kelp is actually not a biological term. It originated in Europe to describe the ash of burnt seaweed. So kelp have been a product that has been used for various reasons um, for, for centuries. It became really intensely valuable in World War I as a source of chemicals that were used in war, including gunpowder. And so this 1918 um, sort of infomercial by the Hercules Power Company is describing the role of kelp in uh, going from war to peace. And they write, the development of a new source of these chemicals, potash and other solvents was vital to the triumph of democracy. Um, and so in this um, uh, period leading up to the um, extraction of kelp uh, and the use of kelp in this way, there were some surveys that were done to support that growing industry. So in 1910 to 1912, the U.S. government undertook a number of uh, surveys along the west coast of North America to support this industrial harvest. And this um, came together in a book called Potash from Kelp, which was compiled by a scientist named Frank Cameron. And it includes um, maps like this one here, 
uh, from uh, William Crandall, which uh, shows the kelp beds. And they mapped the kelp beds all the way down from, from Baja, California up to Alaska. Uh, and so this is the, the spot. If we could stop recording, that would be great. Thanks. Sure, um, hold on just one second okay. before you carry on. It takes me a little second. Okay, here we go. Here's suggesting that um, larger habitat modifications may be needed for full recovery, um, particularly in the in the Florida Bay, as an example. Um, the newspapers highlighting the different perceptions over the seventy uh, or so years of, of, of warming waters, um, suggesting that temperature impacts it, impacts may be um, increased by overfishing, um, and that the perceptions of temperature as fluctuating are supported by this this local climate history. And then finally, this um, commercial survey here for the kelp industry um, showing these spatial patterns in kelp increases and decreases over a century, suggesting that restoring predators may, be, may have utility in buffering climate impacts. Um, and I think I just have a minute or so left, and I just wanted to, to highlight um, a few new projects I've recently relocated to um, Vancouver Island. Um, and so I have a few new projects in the Pacific Northwest that are using similar methods that I'll just briefly mention. Um, so one of those projects is focusing on um, Pacific cod in Alaska, and this is part of a, a larger effort to understand long-term dynamics in this fishery that integrates um, archival data as well as archaeological data and climate records and, um, and oral histories. Um, and so our, my component of this project um, is thinking about the, um, the, what the archives can contribute to understanding um, the dynamics of this fishery. And this is work that an honor student uh, worked on this year and a master's student is picking up this summer, thinking specifically about a collapse that happened in this fishery that's known from the 1920s um, and asking whether this was driven by climate as, um, as um, a recent uh, collapse in the Pacific cod, cod fishery was known to have done in, um, in 2015 and 2016. And so looking back into the archives and looking for uh, similarities and differences between these two periods, between 1920s and the uh, 2015 time period to see um, what might have been causing this earlier uh, collapse in the cod fishery. And then the second uh, project that's being led by a uh, postdoc, Dr. Patrick Hayes, is looking at um, clam gardens in the uh, in Washington and British Columbia, and looking at cannery records and other records associated with the um, the colonial fishery at the beginning of the 20th century, and asking questions around the impact of that fishery on indigenous clam gardens and the ways that these documents may be useful in thinking about um, baselines that may be helpful in terms of um, assessing and planning for recovery. Okay, and with that, I will um, say thanks again for the invitation and look forward to, um, to hearing your questions and the discussion that follows. Well, thank you very much, Lauren. That was just a, ter just a terrific. Uh, seminar, just going through the highlights of your research. You know, what I really love about your research is, you know, how you you show that his, these kind of historical records can be highly relatable to real people and real communities, and they are, you know, obviously tangible implications. That's just like really one of the, the strengths which runs through all of your projects, so congratulations on that. Uh, let's open it up to questions now. You, just a reminder, you can raise your hand uh, if you would like to ask a question yourself, or type a type a question in the chat. We've already got four questions that have come through, so uh, we can start with that unless we have uh, somebody wants to raise their hand. Um, so we, the first question is from Noam Fog Vincent, and they ask, how regularly were these naval charts updated? Can we get any improvement on temporal resolution over that one snapshot? And then they have a second uh, follow-up question to that. Um, and to add to that, lots of recreational divers in the present produce informal amateur maps of reefs. Are there any historical archives of these? Yeah, I love these questions. <laughs> I love thinking about what might uh, might exist out there. Um, so in terms of the first question around updating, uh, yes, they were updated and built on um, year on year. Um, and it actually turns out that the earlier ones are more rich in terms of the ecological information as they get um, sort of more advanced over time. Some of that information around um, things like 
coral and kelp kind of fades out and it's not shown anymore. Um, so uh, these are the these are the bases of the of the charts that we have today. So yes, they've been they've been iterated and built on, but um, it it really is not consistent in terms of um, being able to pull out that ecological information. And so I have the whole series of this one from the Florida Keys, for example. Um, but uh, the, um, the the first one turns out to be the most useful. Um, for kelp, um, it, it, we are doing something similar now, looking at those sorts of charts and thinking about the, that very question about how often they're updated. Um, and in some cases, um, various aspects of them are updated, but the kelp is just drawn on from previous years. Um, and in some cases it represents a new survey. So it takes some sort of like careful looking at differences to see when those, when those were actually representing changes in observation and when they're just carrying over information from, um, from previous years. Um, and then the second um, point, I, I don't know, I think that's, that would be a really great source of information. I would love to know more, but it's not anything that I've worked with. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. So we have a, another question from Rosie. Uh, how have you approached including social media in more contemporary observations of coastal resources? <clears throat> for example, there are Facebook groups of fishers who exchange information about localities in a similar way to print sources. Yeah, that's, I think, a really um, rich source of information. And um, I think the sort of overlaps between um, citizen science and historical ecology are really, really huge. And there's sort of a blurring of that, I think, as you um, sort of move from archives to real time um, and the archives of real time. So you can go back through <laughs> back through Facebook posts and, and things like that now over, over a decade or so. And so, yeah, I um, haven't really drawn on that as much as I think could be done, but I think that there's, there's a lot, I think we're sort of building those archives um, digitally now. Uh, and I think there's a lot of potential to, to, to do that. Um, and I think as people, I think there's also, so there's sort of the modern observations, but I think also as people are realizing that these historical documents and photographs that, you know, they may have in their attics are, are valuable. There's um, people who are posting those in those ways. And I think collecting up that information, um, I think there was an effort to do that at one point. Um, I think I think there's just so much uh, sort of people power out there with these these archives. And I think that's I think it's another sort of relevant point around archives is that it doesn't necessarily require going into some formal institutional space to collect this information. In a lot of cases, they're you know personal collections, and there's a lot of value in in those um, in those resources. Um, so yeah, lots of lots of great stuff. Thanks for the question. We have three people with their hands raised. Uh, so we'll go first with Paul. Paul Harnick. Okay, Paul, you should be able to speak. Go for it. Hi, Lauren. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, great. Wonderful talk. Um, I had a question about George Gould, and, and in a way, it's like building off of the first question you received. Like if, if his nautical maps, if he wasn't so fastidious, and detailed, um, and you were limited to the kind of resolution of the later surveys that you mentioned, how much would we underestimate coral loss in that region? If that makes sense. I'm just thinking like, if you didn't have those maps, but you had some, say 10 years later, kind of what is the magnitude of shift? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's a really good question. And I think um, it sort of gets to that point that I started with, which is that it really depends, like the ability to access this information really depends on somebody valuing whatever version of that um, they, they, they do in some period in the past. And I think George Gould was really an exceptional uh, chart maker. It's not every um, chart that has this sort of information. So um, it's, I, I think there's lots of places where we just don't have this information at all. And I think you're right. I think it does lead to um, underestimating the, the loss of coral. And I think the, the other point um, is that it's a really different type of loss, right? And so we tend to think about coral loss, I think, in, in terms of, you know, live dead, and there's, there's observations of that going back um, decades. But the places that people go to do their those surveys are places where there are reefs. Um, and these 
reefs were just wiped out, I think, before the beginning of sort of this sort of classic spatial uh, version of shifting baseline syndrome, that these reefs just weren't there and they're not places that people think of um, of surveying. And so I think there's this, um, you know, even in this place, I think there's an underestimate, underestimation of, of the loss. Um, and this is one of the few places where we really do have that, that good information. I did um, have a conversation with the archivists at the, um, in the UK, and, and they had the same sort of feeling about George Gould. They're like, we, sh we wish he was, <laughs> we wish there was more of him because his charts are, they have all this ecological information, but they're also just like really beautifully done. And he was this fastidious, chart maker um, that then allows us to go back and get more information that they ne than they necessarily needed at that time out of them. Thanks, Paul. Okay, up next, uh, Jessica, would you like to, let's see if it works now. Yeah, go for it, Jess. Great, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Um, great talk, Lauren, um, I guess. I was really interested in the um, your study on the fishermen's perspectives of how climate how, or you know temperature changes were affecting their catches, and I, I guess I wanted to also share kind of a personal anecdote, which is um, in the year before starting my PhD, I worked as a fisheries observer in the Gulf of Maine, and um, everyone was like, "Oh, what are you doing at, for grad school?" And I would say, "Oh, I'm going to study oceanography." And kind of across the board, everyone was so excited that I was going to go study oceanography because they they were like, we really think that climate is is the number one problem um, in our ability to catch the fish that we want. So it's just really interesting um, that, I don't know, that their interest in climate science was really, they also, it was really kind of convenient to blame climate and not fishing, right? Um, but um, I guess I'm just curious if, um, I don't know, if there's any modern efforts to look at how fishermen are, um, like in the context, longer context of your historical study, if that shift, like, I don't know, what's the trajectory of that shift now? In terms of their perception of, um, of climate, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, so, um, there's a lot in these these newspapers, um, and it's sort of hard to <laughs> to decide what to focus on. But there is also, you know, in 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 some of these old articles, um, sort of descriptions of, um, you know, how seriously she would be taking warming waters. And um, you know, I think definitely in the modern, you know, in this last twenty years, um, there's a strong sense that it's a very serious problem. But even in some of the earlier um, you know, 1940s, 1950s, there's, um, there's sort of a concern um, about the, you know, the impact of, of that over long timescales. And so, yeah, that, that idea of like, when were people aware that this was a bigger problem? Um, and, and how seriously are, are they taking it is something that I think could be um, drawn out more from the historical record. I've also done um, sort of in, in, Sort of coupled with this historical work, interview-based work with fishermen, um, focusing primarily on lobster fishermen in the Gulf of Maine, um, and that's where some of the the ideas around you know how people are perceiving this change for me came from. And I think there's um, you know a lot of sense that there's there's warming waters impact impacts of these warming waters, but it's not always accompanied by a sense that it's um, that it's climate driven, that it, it may just be cyclical. Um, and they are looking back to this earlier time period as an example of that. Um, and in lobster fisheries, I think it's different than others because they did benefit in Maine, at least they right. benefit from yeah. warming waters. And I think there's a sense that that's been a good thing, but there's also this sort of sense that everyone says it's going to crash. And so it's um, sort of, you know, thinking about the ways that, um, that warming waters have driven this this boom, perhaps, and then are think or people are thinking that it may not last forever. Um, they're sort of hopefully thinking that the the I think in some cases that the um, the the same sort of pattern will happen again, where it was a warming period in the '40s that was followed by this cooling period. And they're sort of looking at these. They say it's like the there's the historical peaks and valleys to it is one of the things that people said, and so they are referencing this local climate history and thinking about that. And so I'm, I'm interested in sort of the ways that people understand those local environments based on empirical information, right? It is something that they observed that happened in the past, um, but then applying it to what's happening now may not be totally adaptive. Mm -hmm. I'm also curious about the gap um, in the 
newspapers you were talking about, like Atlantic, or sorry, National Fishermen started kind of recently. And then there's like a couple of decades where there's no industry magazine. What? Um, so Why? we only focused on the recent one. So we didn't actually look for, for the, for that, um, for that, that period in between. Um, gotcha. I think it didn't exist. I think there was a merger that happened. Um, the National Fishermen took over as a merger of those two previous okay. articles, sets, I think, but I think it's a consistent record. So I think it would be possible to go back and look. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Jess, for your question. Uh, up next is William Fears. Please ask your question should work now. William? Can you hear me? There we go. Yeah, okay. we can hear you now. That's great. Um, yes, I was wondering if you had any of these maps, you know, for oysters, um, um, you know, down the East Coast and in uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, uh, there's a book that I recommend for everybody. It's by uh, Mark Kurlinski, and it's called uh, The Big Oyster. And it talks about historical uh, observations since the Dutch got to Manhattan uh, of oysters. And, uh, uh, and he has an historical account of how those oysters were harvested and so forth and who cooked them and who was the power of brokers and so forth and so on and uh they shipped out you know tons and tons and tons you know all around the world which is why it was called the big oyster so uh and they came up with all these recipes so uh, i was just wondering if you had any uh other uh maps uh that uh, of oyster uh beds you know the along the coast similar to the ones of the corals yeah, yeah, I think oysters are a really great um, example of a species that is actually quite easy to look at historical change for relative to other things because it's stuck to the bottom. They're stuck to the bottom. They stay in one place and they were valuable. And so, yes, there are definitely um, maps similar to those that show oyster beds, both, I think, uh, navigationally, but then also in terms of the commercial um, sort of survey type information. Um, I haven't worked with those personally, but I, I know uh, a number of folks who have, and there's some really great work um, in uh, South Australia that uses these um, commercial surveys to document the historical beds of oysters, um, which are then, I think, being really nicely used for, um, for restoration. Um, and I think that, you know, the East Coast of the U.S. would certainly have similar, similar types of, um, of maps and charts. And I know, I'm, I think they must have been used <laughs> by somebody, but I don't, I can't think of that off the top of my head. Just a couple of quick uh, uh, interesting thoughts is, uh, you know, uh, Rachel Smith, you know, at Virginia uh, published a meta-analysis, you know, on oyster reefs and uh, was able to demonstrate, you know, that they sort of serve as a basis for the coral reefs and for the uh, uh, basis for, I'm sorry, not for the coral reefs so much, but for uh, other species, you know, fish and things like that, and ultimately coral reefs. and um, um, and, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, uh, uh, that's an interesting, uh, observation just over the last year. And the other thing is, is that, um, uh, uh you know, the, um, uh, um, well, let's see now, I forgot what I was going to say, this is, uh, excuse me. The, the first observation is great, and I think that's um, that's actually the basis of how the historical data were used for restoration in South Australia. If I understand it, is that they were able to show where the um, where the oysters were historically, and then also make the case that because they were important habitat for recreationally caught fish, they could be um, the restoration of them could be funded with. Um, funds that were designated to augment recreational fisheries. And so those, those both the distribution of the, um, of the oysters and then the links to um, things that we care about now uh, and, and the habitat value of them, I think are, are both really relevant in the context of using historical information for conservation. I remember now the other thing I was gonna say is that I noticed in your presentation, <clears throat> you mentioned that the warming water, you know, was something that was welcomed by uh, the shellfish uh, of, of farmers uh, 
And uh, interestingly, the warmer water is what seems to have a negative effect on the corals. Um, I thought I wonder what you thought about that. Yeah, I think it's it's just really place specific. I think they were in in the spot where they were thinking about um, the uh, raising uh, these exotic oysters for sale in 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 Maine. Um, you know, I think they were happy to uh, to have the warmer waters where they would survive. Um, and I think yeah, it's a very different place um, and set of uh, circumstances than than the impact of um, warming on on corals. And I think um, I think there's also you know in that vein sort of an element. I think, you know, one of the differences is, um, you know, the, the, the various things that have happened to those fisheries over time, but I think it's also um, sort of the general sense of, um, you know, of optimism that was existing at that time in terms of, you know, what we could, what we could do in these fisheries. And in that case, they were thinking um, about, um, you know, the industry that could be developed there around, around the species that didn't natively grow there. And so, yeah, I think it, it really depends on um, the backdrop of um, the environment and then the, you know, the social desires as well. Thanks for the question, William. Thank you very much. That was fascinating. Thanks, Lauren. Um, Lauren, it's Thank past you. the hour. Um, we have one more question or well, somebody has their hand raised. If you would like to stop, we can continue offline and or if you would like to take that question, happy to do so. I'm yeah, I'm fine. I have I don't have to. Okay, so we have one question from Stephen Durham. Stephen, go for it. Hi Lauren, thanks for your talk. I'm curious about with the uh, the Gulf of Maine study. Um, if you had looked at the perceptions of species that were included in both the historical warming event records and the modern warming event records to see if there was, you know, changes in the patterns for those, the same species, the same set of species between different warming events or, or not. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't, we didn't do that. I don't think, um, there was necessarily the resolution to be able to do that because it was looking at, um, I focused a little bit on the Gulf of Maine and what I was talking about, but the study was all up and down the coast. Um, and so um, having consistent information about particular species in particular places, um, you know, there wasn't that, that record over time. I think there were a couple of, you know, in these newspaper articles, it, you know, tended to be uh, high value species that were written about. Uh, but then also there was sometimes columnists in particular places that had running columns. And so, um, you know, one, one person in, um, uh, I want to say somewhere in Cape Cod, I think had a running column. And so if you wanted to, to look at that, like perceptions in, in one place, I think that would be a really good place to look at these, you know, these columns that people had for, for decades about particular locations. Um, the only thing that kind of comes to mind is um, we were looking at uh, sort of um, range expanding species. That was one of the reasons that we started looking at this um, data set. And, you know, for example, black sea bass are something that people are beginning to think about in um, the Gulf of Maine. And those are those were species that were that showed up in this warm water event, these warm water years in, in the 40s. Um, and they were, you know, they were viewed similarly. I think um, they were viewed positively um, in the historical time period, but yeah, having consistent information about particular species in particular places, I think is a little bit challenging. Okay, All right. thanks. All right, thanks Stephen for your, for your question there. Um, so we've come to the end of today, I think. No more questions. Uh, thanks Lauren, that was just a great seminar. Thank you very much for giving the time for that. Um, I have a question, but I'll ask you offline because I think I think it's time to, to, to wrap this up. Um, so let me just say thank you everyone for joining this seminar series. Um, let me just share this Hang on one second. Uh, I wanted to um, thank Lauren especially, but also to remind you that we have uh, another seminar next next month. So every month we have a seminar every Wednesday, first Wednesday of the month. Next month is John Pandolfi who. Um, is going to give a talk on the detection of causes and consequences of novelty in marine ecosystems. And this will actually be the last one that I will host. So I've hosted it for over a year now. And um, this will be the last one. And actually, it's um, it, we're looking for somebody to take it over. 
take on take on leading the Q Money seminar series. And if anyone here would like to do that, please just get in touch with me. It's really great. It's not too much work, and it gives you the chance to like get the people you really want to hear up in front of you. So it's just like really awesome in that sense. Um, so just let me know if anybody online would like to take it over. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I'm going to stop recording now. Thank you all. Thank you again, Lauren, for that terrific seminar. Um, and thanks for everyone for joining. Great. Thanks, Aaron.